I don't believe we're supposed to punch in nine to five. Living is not about a time clock. Living is about every moment, every breath, every second you're given. Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in today. This is episode 21 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder here at Whistlekick, makers of the best sparring gear on earth, as well as great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. You can learn more about our products, like our lightweight polyester t-shirts that make a great base layer under your uniform, over at whistlekick.com. And you can learn more about the podcast, including all of our past episodes, show notes for this one, and a whole lot more, all for free, over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter full of information, discounts, and useful martial arts content. And if you're an Android user, you can check out our new Android app on the Google Play Store. Just search for Whistlekick. It's an easy way to stay connected with the show, and it's free. And now to the episode. This week, we're joined by Professor Brandon Beliso. Professor Beliso is an incredibly insightful and motivational man. He not only owns multiple martial arts schools, he consults with people on how to make their schools better. We talked a lot about his past with the martial arts, and sometimes just life in general. I came away from today's episode feeling inspired, and I hope you do too. And now, Professor Beliso, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I'm grateful to be here, Jeremy. Really grateful. Well, thank you. It's it's going to be fun. Um, you know, we can let everybody know that this is actually our second time recording. <laughs> that the first time there was some some audio issues a couple of weeks ago, and then we had some some trouble scheduling. So you're actually your episode's coming out a little bit later than I wanted to. Uh, you know, I think the stuff that you're doing is great, and I want to share it with everybody. And thank you. I'm sure our conversations will be even better than last time. Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. So why don't you start by telling everybody? How you got into this? How how'd you get going with the martial arts? Um, actually, it was because of my dad. Um, my dad, a little step further, my dad got into the martial arts in 1960, I think, four sixty five. 65. What happened was him and my uncle had to go to one of his ex-wife's house to talk about child support. And she had a couple guys waiting there for him. And they jumped my dad and my uncle. So my dad and my uncle just barely got out of there because um, we grew up in a rough and tumble neighborhood in the mission of San Francisco, some pretty bad parts. And uh, so immediately my dad went into a gentleman named Ralph Castro, who's a very popular Kenpo stylist in San Francisco, and enrolled in his classes. So my earliest recollections of the martial arts being a young kid, four or five years old, was hanging on this rail watching these guys train. And story goes, and, and I don't know, you know, because I was so young, I don't recall it all, but this guy, Ralph Castro, trained with Bruce Lee. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's really cool, right? So there, there was very strong probability. I was some little kid running around not knowing that that's Bruce Lee right there, you know, training with this guy, Ralph Castro. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool history. And if anyone doesn't know about Ralph Castro, he studied with a guy named William Chow. So Ed Parker, who we all know, right, American mm-hmm. Denver, Ed Parker sure. and Ralph Castro studied with William Chow, came here to the mainland. Uh, Castro stayed with Parker till about seven degree, and then Parker went off in the American Kenpo direction. Well, Ralph Castro, you know, wanted to stay closer to the lineage, so he went back to Chow, and he stayed more with what's called Shaolin Kenpo, closer to the Shaolin roots. And so mm-hmm. that's the style was my base system. So my dad got me into it. You know, I, I, back when I studied, when I studied, I'm still studying, but back when I started, there were no uniforms for kids, and kids didn't study. And it was a novelty. You'd see it on Johnny Carson. We have an 11-year-old black belt. And it was such a novelty to see any kid doing the martial arts, let alone earning a black belt by the age of 11. You know, it was an, an anomaly. So I actually started martial arts, I would probably say three and a half, four, but they didn't have uniforms big enough. So right, right. I got my first uniform, I think, when I was five. And that was 1967. <laughs> my mom made my first gig. Yeah, yeah. She sewed it up because I was, I was four. Yeah. yeah. But here's my introduction to the martial arts. Because kids weren't studying back then, right? Kids really didn't get into the martial arts until the 1980s when Karate Kid came out. You know, once Karate Kid came out, everybody wanted to be Ralph Macchio. So karate wasn't really, any martial arts for that fact, wasn't really popular until that movie came out. I mean, sure, we had the Bruce Lee movies. We had Kung Fu the series. You know, we even had that cartoon Hong Kong Fui. But nothing, you know, like Karate Kid just elevated martial arts, you know, with kids. So I would think I was five. So I had to prove, being my father's son, that I wouldn't disrupt the classes, right? Adults don't want to train with kids. So I was allowed to sit in the corner, and no toys, no crayons, no coloring books, in a kneeling position 
for two hours a night, three, four days a week. And that went on for about two, three months. Yeah. And then I, since I was quiet and I sat still and I did move around, I was allowed to join the class. So it's a far cry from where things are today, but that, that was really my introduction. That, that's a tremendous amount of focus and patience for such a young kid. Yeah. Well, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, my, my papa expected nothing less. Nothing less. Yeah. Do you, do you remember what it, what it was like at, at that point, you know, clearly you're wanting to join classes. Absolutely. I mean, did, did, you, did you, you connected those dots that I need to do this if I'm going to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's a simple theory. You ring the bell, you know, and the dog salivates and sits and wants, wants the treat. You know, it's just the yeah. same type of theory. Um, I, I've always loved the martial arts. I love the art of it. You know, the violence part, I, I wasn't really into. I mean, I was a state champion. I fought for years, but I never believed imposing my will upon somebody. You do as I say, because I can hurt you or you respect me because I can beat you up was never really what I got into. What I got into, what, what really fascinated me about the martial arts was to be able to stand in front of somebody and say, you can't hit me. I won't allow it. That's pretty powerful to be able to stand there and move and not let somebody hit you, you know, without having to hit them or hurt them. And, and that part I found brilliant. And you know where that came from? And that's, you know, going back to your question is, is I would sit there and, you know, I wanted to be Bruce Lee. I wanted to Bruce Lee. So if I sit there and I'm still and I don't move around, I don't do nothing, you know, I can, I can, I can do that. I can do that. Cause I'd already seen Marlowe, which was a movie with James Garner where Bruce Lee kicks out this light in his office. And I'd already seen a couple of episodes of Long Street where Bruce Lee was a guest instructor teaching this blind private investigator, you know, how to defend himself against this bully that was bullying him. So I'd already had a little bit of exposure to Bruce Lee. And then, of course, just watching my dad and all these guys every night was in the basement of our flat. And, and I, this basement had poles and pillars, and the ceiling couldn't have been more than seven or eight feet high. You know, back then in the late 60s, nothing was built to code, right? So it's whatever you did, you did. And these guys would be sit there sparring and bare knuckled, right? There was no groin cup, no hand gear, no feet gear, no shin guards, nothing, nothing. And these guys are banging it out. I'm sitting in the corner. I was just like, you know, it was like watching, you know, gladiators in the Coliseum. It just was something that I thought was amazing. But the part I didn't like, uh, well, I did though. People would get hit and nobody got mad. Nobody got upset. If you got punched in the face, it's, hey, thank you. I should have been keeping my hands up. <laughs> really? I mean, that's yeah. you grew up. You never got mad because that was part of learning that control to control that anger, control that adrenaline when you feel like you're you're at, at a disadvantage and you're being beaten or you can get hurt. So I, I really dug the art part of it. The violent, I, the violence part, I never got into. That's why I was re really, really good when I was a fighter because I didn't like getting hurt and I didn't like hurting people. So you know, that, that's why I'd sit in that corner two hours a night and I had no problem with that because I knew even at that young age of five years old that this is something that would be my life. Well, wow. it's pretty powerful. And that's a great way to open. It's, um, you know, of course, we're all about stories here and that's a great origin story, so to speak, if you're, you know, if we think about superheroes, you know, their origin story, that's yours. But I know you've got a lot more stories, so I'd like you to think about your best one and why don't you share that with us? Yeah, there's just too many. You know, there's way too many. I, mean, I had the privilege of, you know, when we grew up in tournaments, tournament scene was really big for us. We had the California Karate Championship. We had the Long Beach Internationals Championship. These two-day events where you would fight. And then the next night, you know, on a stage, every first and second place winner would fight each other. You know, uh, every division starting from 8 to 10, 11 to 13, 14 to 16. You know, girls, lightweight men, white belts, brown belts, black belts, all the way up to grand champion. And it was really something that we looked forward to. I remember CKC, one of, one of my experiences, there were three rings, 100 kids in each ring for my division. Just my division, wow. 8 to 10. Now you're in the <laughs> tournament and, you know, we fought down. So it was six in one ring, six in another, then it was 18. Then the 18 fought down the nine, and then you fought down the two. I mean, incredible stuff like that. Yeah. And then to be able to sit there and, and fight and finish and then sit at the edge of the this, this stage that was elevated, I don't know, four feet off the ground. And it was all wood, plywood, really crappy. You had to fight on this dusty, you know, wooden stage. And there was no ring around it. If you got knocked off the stage, <laughs> got knocked off it just the way it was. You know? Right. And, and I get to watch Benny Equates. You know, I, I got to watch Chuck Norris. You know, I got to watch Jeff Smith. 
I got to watch people like that fight. It was pretty cool. And not knowing being a kid, I watched Al DeCoscos. I used to run around the tournament scene with Mark DeCoscos. You know, we would compete in the morning, right? And then our parents competed at night. So we'd be running around this place, you know, just exploring this big civic center auditorium. And I don't think Mark even remembers that, you know, because um, his mom remembers, though. His mom remembers. Yeah. And Al, Al would remember. But we did that as kids. And then, you know, you know where Mark is today. So just things like that. I mean, it, it really had that Budo spirit. And tournaments were five bucks. But, you know, there, there was no ambulance. There was no, there was no medical team, nothing. And you got in there and, and no gloves, no shin guards, no mouthpiece, no groin cup. I didn't even know what a groin cup was till some kid came in from Little League and, and into a karate class. And he had this groin cup. And he was changing. We said, well, that might be a good idea. <laughs> we should be wearing a groin cup when we do this, you know? Yeah. And But you know what it forced us to do? You had to be good. You had to be proficient. Because if somebody kicked you in the groin, it wasn't a happy day. If somebody punched you in the face, bare, bare knuckled, it wasn't a happy day. So I think the level of proficiency, not taking anything away, I think MMA fighters are awesome. But, you know, point fighters, we're talking tournament point fighters. Um, very pe few people make that transition. I mean, Ray McDaniels is doing it, but he's pretty awesome. I think he's an exceptional fighter all the way around. Um, but, you know, most point fighters, it's a game of tag. They're off balance. You know, they're going to give you three points for kicking somebody in the head, but only one point for punching them. I mean, when the day's done, whether I punch or kick you in the face, it's going to hurt. So right. you're dancing around on one leg, hopping, and, you know, in Kenpo, God, that, 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 that's like a get out of jail free card. If you're going to dance around on one leg, I'm going to kick you in the groin, you know? Mm -hmm. So tournaments have changed a lot. And that's why I personally don't support them. I, my, I don't bring my students to the open tournaments that are out there nowadays. Um, so that, that, that was one story. I mean, there's so many. I remember one, there was this kid in our division and, and we were petrified. He was like huge. I don't know if he was like 20 and he was just saying he was 11 to 13, I don't know, but he was scary. And he had been in a fire. So he had some, he had a fake hair on like a wig and his face was, you know, partially burnt and everybody was petrified of this guy. I mean, he, out, he outweighed me by 50 pounds, must have been at least two heads taller than me. And, and he had a vicious sidekick, vicious sidekick. And so he'd get in the ring with every, whoever was sparring and all he would do is throw one of these sidekicks, blast a kid in the rib or the arms. And this kid just stood there the rest of the fight crying, not wanting to get near this monster. Mm. My dad in all his brilliance said, you know, this kid was up for first and second. So it was me and him. And my dad said, okay, I want you to stand at the edge of the ring while we're waiting because there were a couple of fights before us and you're going to practice a drop kick. I said, what, what, are you, what is that? I'd never done it in my life. You know, basically when the guy throws his sidekick, you slide under it, down onto your hands and you pump a sidekick, you know, into the guy's groin, you know, with the bottom of your foot. So imagine that I'd have to go down underneath this guy's foot coming at me which I've never done this before, and kick this guy in the groin. Can you visualize that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So there you go. So I'm practicing this with one, one, one of our black belts. He's throwing the sidekick at me. I'm falling to the ground, but I had to slide in. So you can't just right. drop. You have to slide under the kick, you know, and, and kind of slide into home base and then pump the foot up to the groin. And so we did that, and I'm doing this for like five, ten minutes, going, I'm never going to be able to throw this thing. At all. I've never done this. You know, we we're trying to practice it on the fly. But little did I know the brilliance of my father, the ki this kid and his coach are watching us. So guess what his coach told him? Don't throw your best Don't throw the sidekick? Don't throw your best weapon. Do not okay. throw your best weapon. This guy's going to kick you in the groin. He's smaller and faster. He will score points. Do not throw your best weapon. And that was it. The guy stood there the whole fight because he that's all he had. And I beat him. So, I mean, things like that, the strategy that went in, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many, there's so many. I remember fighting side by side, side with George Chung, anyone who knows who George Chung is out there. And we were on a mixed team together at the Cow Palace, really big venue, you know, fighting some other team and beating them. You know, it was camaraderie like that. We get two, three guys from different schools and form a team. It just, it, it, the spirit of it was, it was really, really special, special for me. You know, and, and back then growing up in the streets of San Francisco, um, you know, we, it was a time where you could fight somebody when the fight was over, you shook hands and said, hey, okay, good day, right? It, it wasn't like today. Now you fight somebody, they go get their cousin, they get a gun, they shoot you. I mean, it's a, it's a whole different day. So a lot of what we learned in the school, we actually took out into the street to practice it. 
Mm. We did. But when it was done, when you'd fight somebody in a schoolyard, like I said, when it's done, you shook hands and you were friends. So a lot of what we learned, we would go practice on a daily basis. And I remember one of it was this jumping, spinning, I don't know what it was. And, and it looked so cool though, right? And being a martial artist, we all wanted to do it. Well, I remember going out in the street and the first thing I did, and the kid was a boxer. I jumped up in the air to throw this kick. And before my foot hit the ground, this guy hit me like four or five times. <laughs> I swear. And so after that, I said, I want some of that. And that's for me where my introduction to kickboxing came. I was 12 years old, maybe. You know, I was one of the best in the state. And I threw this groovy kick I thought was really bad. And, and he hit me like four times before my foot ever touched the ground. So that's when I started studying boxing. So, I mean, I got tons of stories, Jeremy. Tons. Tons, tons, tons. And those are a few great ones, absolutely. And I know we'll we'll get to some more of them as we move on. But clearly the martial arts is probably the most foundational thing in your life other than absolutely. food and breath and you know, maybe maybe your your family, you know, out out of California. But I'd like you to think about the benefits that you took from the martial arts. You know, think about how you grew and how in looking back, you can say that the martial arts helped shape your personality. And tell us about that. Well, I think more than shaping my personality, the martial arts saved my life at, at many times. I mean, I was a small, sickly kid who stuttered, so I wouldn't speak at all because people would tease me. Back then, there was Warner Brothers and a character named Porky Pig. And if anyone knows Porky Piggy, he was like, ah, the, 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 he stuttered. So I basically didn't speak much as a young child, but the martial arts gave me the inner, inner resilience. The martial arts gave me that self-confidence, you know, because what makes martial arts very unique and, and why I think everybody should do it, especially in a Western culture, is that it's based upon that Eastern philosophy. We're building ourselves from the inside out. Western mm -hmm. culture, we reach out externally, bigger card you know, bigger house, different relationship, more money, different job. You know, that's how America works. I mean, without being stereotypical, what do most women do when they're upset? They go shop and they buy a bunch of stuff they don't need, you know, and, and that's classic. That's a classic example of the behavior. So the martial arts, instead of me reaching out, be my friend, please, you be my friend, you be my friend. Externally for approval, the martial arts taught me to go work from the inside out, building that self-confidence through hard work, never giving up, always doing my best, in which I, 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 I describe as that's how we earn confidence. Nobody's born with confidence. We earn confidence. And you can only do that by never giving up, by always doing your best, by working really, really hard. So the martial arts gave me that value. You know, in the neighborhoods I grew up in, people dealt drugs, ran in gangs. I mean, I was carrying a gun when I was 12 years old. I was running in a gang. But fortunately and unfortunately, it saved my life when the gang got shot up at a garage party. I wasn't there because I was the youngest one in the group and I wasn't allowed to go to a lot of those parties. But our leader was 15 great martial artists shot and killed, shot and killed at 15, got shot in the face because you can't stop a bullet. You can't stop a bullet. And so that's another time. And then, of course, drugs. I mean, in my neighborhood, drugs were rampant. I had a brother that, that was a pretty big coke dealer. And, and I, I helped him, you know, at 16, 17, sell drugs. And the martial arts, again, brought me straight to center and back onto that path. So I never veered left or right too far with all these temptations, with all these trappings of growing up in the ghetto. The martial arts always brought me back, kept me straight. You know, I never went to jail. I, I'd, I'd never been convicted of anything crazy or anything like that. So the martial arts really saved me, where most of my friends today are either dead in jail or they're still on the corner of 24th and Mission dealing dime bags of marijuana going, look at me, I'm an OG, which means a original gangster. I just look at them, Jeremy, I go, OG, oh, I can't believe you're still doing that stuff. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's another example how the martial arts saved me. And we don't even talk about business. I mean, I've owned a bunch of different businesses throughout my lifetime because the martial arts taught me good work ethic. I'm not afraid to work hard. I love to work hard. See, again, our culture perpetuates, get rich quick, win the lottery, go to Vegas, right. you know, work two hours a week and make a million dollars. That's BS. You don't think Steve Jobs, you know, God bless his soul, worked really, really hard to create Apple? Of course he did. You don't think right. Bill Gates worked really, really hard to build Microsoft? Of course he did. You know, so that's, that's one thing it's, it's given me in business. I posted that yesterday. Somebody said, everything you touch turns to gold. I said, no, 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 no. I work really, really hard. And I love yeah. hard work. It doesn't stress me out. It doesn't bother me. And that's one of the ethics I think the martial arts gave me. So just those, those are just, you know, a few of the benefits. Wow. Those, those are fantastic. Yeah. And we definitely have that attitude, I think, 
in the United States and in Western culture, as, as you're calling it, that you can take a pill yeah. and it'll solve your problems. Oh, yeah. And I think we all know, and a lot of people, if anybody out there listening is taking a medication, they're probably on more than one because they're probably the side effects from the first one. You know, that there's no, there's no magic bullet here that solves all of your problems yes. other than hard work. I mean, there's magic in hard work. It, it makes things happen. You're bringing intention. You're manifesting things, however you want to look at it. It makes stuff yeah, happen. But, but, but with that said, you know, everybody runs around Facebook. That's a big acronym now, you know, GSD, right? Get this shit done. Uh, the challenge with that is how, how often do people work 12, 14 hour days, especially the entrepreneur, and get nothing done? You know, so I want to change that acronym. I want to say get the right this shit done. Right. Yeah. It's really important that, that you have that type of vision uh, in place because people don't. So I love hard work and, and hard work is awesome. There's nothing the matter with it because you're right. It does. You feel better about yourself. It builds your self-esteem. You get, you know, it, you advance yourself. Everything grows around you. I mean, there's nothing the matter with hard work. And I wish our culture would stop shying away from it. Like it's this light on a vampire. It's God awful thing to work hard because it's not. It's not. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. So you mentioned some great names, some people that you had the opportunity to train with and, and that your, your father trained with. But I'd like you to think about, of all the people that you trained with, who was the one that was the most instrumental in your martial arts upbringing? You know, I've had many great teachers. There's a gentleman that a lot of people never recognized because uh, he never became as famous as Rick Alamany. You know, Rick Alamany is my teacher till to today, even. And I remember him, he fought Chuck Norris. I think Chuck Norris might have beat him. But, you know, I watched him fight Chuck Norris. How cool is that? You know, and the guy's beaten. He was just amazing. I watched him fight. And every time he fought, he smiled. And that would freak people out. Because how many people are going to get in the ring with you and smile the whole time they're fighting you, right? Very, very I, few. I, Only the crazy that ones. Guy. I remember one time, because he, he was a bouncer. Um, but he was fighting at, I don't know who he was fighting. might have been a guy named John Natividad, who was a really popular fighter back in the day. But Rick got his nose broke. So his nose is on the side of his freaking face, literally. Mm. And he didn't want to stop fighting. It's like, whoa, you know, okay, time's up, pencil's down, nose is broke, you know, let's go to the... No, he took a piece of tape, taped down his nose and beat this guy. Oh, man. That kind of spirit is, is something that's infused in me. And he's my teacher till to this day. But it's, you know, things like him... You know, Rick Alamini, my dad, of course, my dad, I was so young and so dumb. I didn't understand. I, you know, I thought he was just being a dad, just, you know, but a lot of what my father taught me is just incredible, incredible. And, and my dad's another one. That's another unsung hero. You know, he's been, he's at a same school in the same location, 45 years in the worst part of San Francisco. And he stays there and serves that community. You know, he n never has any more than 100, 150 students day in or day out. But, you know, my father's amazing in that capacity. He does something and he does it really well. And he doesn't veer from it. You know, he doesn't go out of the box, but he taught me that too. Don't be a jack of all trades. You know, don't be, and you see, that's the big problem, I think, with a lot of martial artists that are just starting out. They try to do some jujitsu, they want to do some kung fu, do some krav maga, a little of this, and they put all of that in their school and end up sucking in all of them. You got to do something mm. really, really well. So, see, people are mistaken that about Bruce Lee. He had 14 years of what? Wing Chun under his belt before he started yeah. branching out? I mean, he was yeah. pretty solid in Wing Chun before he ever started veering off in other directions. So my daddy taught me that. Be proficient at something. But I've had great seminars. I mean, I took a seminar with Hoist Gracie. You know, I've taken seminars with Bill Wallace. I've taken you know, seminars with Remy Priestess. I mean, God, how lucky am I? Dave Kovar, you know, who, who's a living legend. I mean, I get to take seminars with these guys all the time. Ernie Reyes. I mean, there's so many great martial artists out there. And, and I think really my, my biggest influence is just being a white belt, being that learner that I could learn something from Mickey Mouse. My papa used to say that. If you come here to learn, you know, you'll learn something from Mickey Mouse. And, and that's the other thing that I think lacks today is that humility to keep an open mind at a black belt level to walk into school. I mean, I went into one school and he goes, no, no, you got to wear your black belt, professor. I said, absolutely not. Give me a white belt. I don't want no responsibility. You know, give me a white belt. That's why I'm here. So I don't have to be professor anybody. Let me just strap on a white belt. So never forget that. I think that's our greatest teacher. Our greatest teacher out of all these teachers I've had in my lifetime is, is, the, teach, is the, the teaching of learning. You know, be a learner. 
Don't be a teacher. That's a problem. People become teachers and they stop learning. You mentioned some of the names that you mentioned are, are, are great names, either people that we've had on the show, like Bill Wallace, or people that um, we've talked to. I, I actually had the opportunity to train with Mr. Kovar just a couple of weeks ago yeah, at a, a big seminar here on the East Coast, and, and he was as incredible as I'd heard. So yeah, he that was a lot of fun. So those are the people that, that you have trained with. Who would you want to train with? Yeah. Who haven't you been yeah, able Benny to? Yeah, Benny for sure. You know, I've just taken yeah. t- tidbits of his seminars and stuff at the Super Show. You know, stepped in, stepped out because I'm really busy there myself. I'd love to train with Benny. Uh, I would love to train with Benny and spend a lot of time with him. You know, absolutely. I, I, Helio Gracie. I mean, I know he's not here anymore, but I would love to train with Helio Gracie. You know, I mean, Hoist is amazing, but to be able to spend time with, with his father would have been just something incredible sure. for me. And I think Helio Gracie would, would be another one I'd love to train with. Absolutely. Is there something different about those two gentlemen in the way that they, they teach or they train that calls to you versus other people? Yeah, they're the real deal, man. <laughs> they, they live, eat, breathe martial arts. You know, that's why you got, to, you got to experience Dave Kovar. He's a living example of that. He lives, eats, drinks, breathes martial arts 24-7. You know, I, I'm at a point in my life, I'm 53, I've got a three-year-old and a six-year-old, so I have to balance my life. In, in that way, you know, and so if I was still single and I wasn't married, I'd be training all the time too. So mm-hmm. I, I envy the fact that they get to do that 24 seven and they have handlers that handle their business handlers that take care of booking them and stuff. You know, I, I'm busy handling a three and a six year old. So I, I, I like to train with real martial artists and they say, what do you mean? What's a real martial artist? You walk, your talk, you live by example. There's no doubt. And when Dave Kovar shows you something, he knows his stuff. When Benny hits you with that spinning reverse kick that he's, he, he's so well known for, that jumping spinning reverse kick, you will know that that's not, that's not a reverse kick from a foot. It's a reverse kick from a spirit at a heart level. There is no doubt in his mind that he is a martial artist. And I dig that. I dig training with people like that. And you get that a lot. You see that? A lot? You know why I see that a lot? With a lot of these Brazilians coming over from Brazil in jiu-jitsu. You know, I, I have a hard time working with them on a business level because they're, they're so um, loyal to the spirit of jujitsu and the way you earn belts and the way you do business. But you know what? They're real deals. These guys are real deals. I did a seminar for them and I was showing them some stand up and they would, you know, they were hybriding it right into a jujitsu move and they knew their stuff very clearly and they're very, they, they may make no bones about it. They train hard and, and it's not about the money. And, and I get that. I get that too. But, but I wish I could help these guys make, make a good living so they can sustain their art. Yeah. Eventually. Maybe it'll just take some time. Yeah, because you're trying to find that balance. Somebody posted that some 16-year-old blue belt is the head instructor. I, I, I saw that yeah, post. I yeah. saw that. And you know, that's ridiculous. That's just ridiculous. I wouldn't let any 16-year-old run my school, let alone a blue belt, a blue belt in anything, anything, right. anything. Makes no difference. But I think it's just a marketing thing. You notice he's not in a picture by himself. He's got the two instructors with him. I just think it's right. a marketing ploy. I think they're laughing all the way to the bank and back with that. But, you know, it's created controversy. The jiu-jitsu world is on its ear and, and they're not happy with it. So, you know, yep. I think. But it's, probably- al- it's also sparks some discussion. Yes. And, and anytime there's good discussion yes. about martial arts and quality and, and, and all that, I mean, Bad doesn't come out of it. I mean, no. some people get might get their noses bent out of shape, but no. certainly, as we talk more and and you know in in an environment like this where you and I are conversing, as well as all of the millions of conversations that go on that aren't ultimately public, we're advancing the arts. We're making them well, better because absolutely. we're talking, we're sharing. Yeah. But but if I could I could write on that, you know, I want to tell people out there: do what you do well. I was talking to a guy yesterday that's having challenges. He's been around 10 years, has a little less than 100 students now, you know, and he was all the way down to 40. And I said, well, what's your core system? He said, Taekwondo. I said, well, then you're not teaching it well. He says, what do you mean? He said, well, what do you have a black belt in? Taekwondo. And then I said, sir, you're not teaching it well. Because if after 10 years you have 40 students and you're on the verge of closing, you know, your main product is Taekwondo. You don't teach it well. The numbers right. don't lie. You know, people trip 75% of my revenue is on traditional Kempo Karate. I do it well. I do it well. I've done four years of jiu-jitsu. I would never tell anybody I can teach you jiu-jitsu. Never. But that's my value system. I'm not going to go take an eight-hour certification in Krav Maga and then throw it up on my window and say, hey, come take Krav Maga classes. 
You know, we often mm. think because we're a black belt that we can all of a sudden we're experts on bully defense. We're experts on women's self-defense. We're experts on life skills. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're just a guy that made it to black belt. So you need to do your homework. You need to be proficient. You know, if I was to teach jiu-jitsu, I would make sure I have a black belt in jiu-jitsu. If I was to teach judo, I would make sure I have a black belt first. So I think that's the other challenge is, is people are out there trying to grab all these different things to make money when in the end, it's just like being at, at, at a, a smorgasbord in Vegas. You go to a buffet in Vegas, is the Japanese food really, really good? No. Is American food really, really good? No. All the food's just okay. It's just okay. But if I want good Italian food, I'm not going to go to a buffet in Vegas. I'm going to go to a really good Italian restaurant. And I think the same thing here, it needs to perpetuate itself. We need to be proficient at what we do, really proficient, before we decide to branch out. It's, it's a great point. And it's something that, yeah, I, I'm starting to see more and more of because I think people are trying to appeal to everyone. And you're a businessman, I'm a businessman. And one of the things that's pretty common amongst traditional business philosophy is hone in on your on your core market you know what is it that you do better than everybody that's else right. and start with that that's right and if you're trying to do everything hoping something's going to stick it's all going to fall off the wall. right and i'm saying if your core product what you were reared in what you have a black belt in you you can't grow your school with that do you think you're going to grow your school with my program or somebody else's? Absolutely not. It's a Band-Aid. It's a temporary fix. It's going to all fall apart at some point because if you can't teach what you know really, really well, you're not going to teach my program or somebody else's really well either when the day's right. done. So yeah, you need to be proficient at what you do. Really, really proficient. And that's you know what you see with some of the better schools, the bigger schools. And I would even say on a business level, these schools that are really successful teach one core system. And then they might have jelly beans or icing on the cake, you know, but they don't try to be a jack of all trades. Yeah, great, great points. You're really good at saying things that leave me kind of, I don't want to say speechless, but without much to add. So <laughs> good job. <laughs> um, we've covered a lot of good stuff. And let's kind of switch gears a little bit into some more of the fun stuff. We'll come back around to some of these things that, that you're talking about with your system and everything. But... Uh, how about movies? I mean, you, you talked about Bruce Lee, and I mean, I'm, do you have a favorite martial arts movie I'm or a, movies? I'm a martial arts movie junkie. Okay. You know, I can remember as a young kid, we had a movie theater called the Grand Theater, and every Sunday, we'd get dropped off when the movie theater opened at about noon, and they'd have back to back to back martial arts films, three in a row, mm. and literally, they would lock all the kids in this auditorium. We'd have a Coke in one hand, jujubes in another, whatever, sugar. And by the end of the first, second movie, we're flying through the aisles, kicking each other. <laughs> I cut my teeth on, on early days. There was a movie called Five Fingers of Death. I don't know if you know that one, right? Right? I do. Yeah. Classic with the Ironside song. Right? His hands would glow. Um, but you know what I dug about that movie, which I didn't really get till I was much older, was how in the opening scene, Right, the old, old teacher looks at this guy and goes, I've taught you all I can teach. I'm gonna send you to the other part of the country in the Kowloon province to learn from so-and-so. How, hum how humble is that? You got these instructors, no, you must stay with me forever, you indentured servant. Only study my style, because my white Kung Fu, Kung Fu is better than your tiger dog, you know? And, and so right. that was brilliant. That is the martial arts mindset in essence, when the humility of a teacher to a student to say, I cannot teach you anymore. You must go over here. That's so cool. So um, that kind of stuff, there was a guy back in the day called Alexander Fuxing. Uh, I think it was in The Five Deadly Venom. I loved all those films. I would go to Chinatown at the Jackson Movie Theater. And you know, the voices never match. Rats are running across our feet, literally. And we'd watch things like that. Uh, the 18th, 18th Chambers with Gordon, can never say his last name, Liu, Lao, Gordon. You know, he, he, he did all the Kill Bill films too. Oh, okay. He did yeah. 36 Chambers, anything. Then, you know, Bruce Lee was my hero. So pick a film, Chinese Connection, The Big Boss, which was later called Fist of Fury, you know, Return of the Dragon, Enter the Dragon, The Game of Death. I mean, I cried. I was at Internationals and Bruce Lee died. And I was showing it on the screen. I cried. I just cried. But even after he died, I watched every, you know, per impersonator that came out after him. Remember they had all those impersonators that looked like Bruce Lee a little bit? Yeah. All those strings and films. I even watched those. You know, of course, Black Bell Jones, Jim Kelly. I watched Jim Kelly. I watched the Kung Fu series, you know, that was out for a while. 
um, anything, anything that's got to do with martial arts. Today, Donnie Yen, I think one of the most underrated is Donnie Yen. Donnie Yen is an amazing martial artist. He's incredible. Yeah, when I saw that Ip Man movie, the first one, and he fought those yeah. Japanese guys for the rice. Yeah, people, I mean, I know he's huge in China, he's, but he should be really, really big here. I mean, he's so underrated. And then, of course, Jackie Chan, Jet Li. You know, I watched every Chuck Norris film, every one of them, even his TV sure. series, you know. What's that TV series he had recently? Walk, uh, walk, yeah. Walker. 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 Right yeah. yeah. And Lone Wolf McQuaid, that movie. I watched everything, anything and everything that comes out. The big ones I like now is the, the Raid, The Raid 1 and 2. Those are pretty clean movies where the fight scenes, you know, are very strong, simple. I, I, I like the, you know, the standard classical Chinese one where they fly through the air and it's all fantasy. And I get that, you know, I get that. But if I got to watch somebody spin around the air in slow motion, like in Hero, one more time, it's like. So I, I really like some some of the Donnie Yen stuff and, and the rate, even Ang Bang, you know, Tony Jaa, mm, his stuff. Yeah. Some can be. It's really rhythmic and dance. But if you look closely, there's some really good clean exchanges that that are straight up street fighting, and I dig that stuff too. I, and we never go to watch the plots. It's not going to happen. And of course, you know, some of the Stephen Chow, the silly stuff, the Shaolin soccer, you know, his his whole genre. It's kind of fun and funny as well. You know, so anything, man, anything that's got to do with martial arts perpetuates, you know, growing up, Teenage Mutant Ninja Mutant Turtles, Power Rangers, you, you take it. You take it. anything that's got to do with the martial arts. I will watch it. No matter how painful it might be, I will watch it. <laughs> What did you think of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon when it came Well, I, I love that it really elevated the martial arts to a whole new level. I mean, we're always looking for that next thing to help boost us. You know? and, and, and I love that genre, you know, of just the whole, the same thing, the Manchu era, suppressing the Chinese, overcoming them. I get all that, but I think it's way played out now. You know, what was unique about it at that time is he took that genre and um, elevated it. Was it Ang Lee who did that movie? No. It's the I director. Things I don't have it off the top of my head. Yeah, but he's really famous. I know he went on to but, do stuff yeah. with John Travolta and a couple of different things. Um, yeah. Might have been him. Anyway, so it did. It really brought that colorful. It really showed the richness of the culture. It really showed that in depth. But I think it's way played out now. Way, way played out. You know, and it's done. Because if you got to dance over trees, we know that's never going to happen. I don't care if I, I study for the next 40 years. I'm not flying across trees. That'll never happen. It's not, phys you know, it's not possible. It's not so, but you know, that helps us what it did for me though. And I think like many people's, wow, martial arts can help me be better than better. And, and, and I love that about it, you know, and then Chow Yun Fat, of course, I've watched all his stuff. Mm. I just, you know, just good it's stuff. Fantastic. House of Flying Daggers is another great movie, right? Very colorful, very rich. Did you watch that one, House of Flying Daggers? If I did, it was a long time oh, you got to see that one too. That's got some good fun as out. well. How about, are there any that you think of that are particularly bad? I mean, really bad, but are still worth watching maybe because the fight choreography is really good? Um, you know, that, that never give up, never surrender, that first Claude Van Damme film where he wasn't oh. anybody yet. And he was yeah. A really bad kid, and he jumped up and did the splits on the end of the boxing ring and sat there, Van Damme. Yeah, it's horrible. I mean, there's so many bad ones, but it doesn't matter as long as it perpetuates the martial arts. I mean, some of the later Steven Seagal films are just terrible. So, <laughs> yes. so bad. You know, they're just so bad. But hey, if it perpetuates martial arts and promotes the culture, I don't care. If it's going to inspire one more kid or one more adult to get off the couch and go take martial arts, I don't care. I don't care how bad it is, really. You know, I love the best of the best, Philip Ree. You know, his stuff is cool, mm -hmm. right? The first one, then they started to get crazier and crazier. But that's okay, too. That's okay, too. Anything that perpetuates the arts, um, I'm there. Good or bad or indifferent. You know, it really doesn't matter when the day's done. You know, um, that Surf Ninjas, that was horrible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. If you yeah. do martial arts because of it, who cares? Who cares, right? Right, right. And, and if nothing else, it was, you know, it was fun to laugh at. Yeah, mindless entertainment. Sometimes you've got to shut down. I don't always have to watch some documentary about climate control, you know? I don't always have to be in that position. Sometimes we need to look at what it is. It's entertainment, right? Absolutely. It's entertainment. When, when what's his name? Jason Lee did the remake of Dragon, you know, the Bruce Lee story. Some of it was really good, but when he threw some of those kicks, I mean, they were horrible. They were just horrible. But you know what? He's not a martial artist, nor is he meant to be. You know, he just was the best person to play the role. But he had that one fight scene where that, that you know, that still nobody knows it's folklore when he fought that 
Jack Man, whoever in Chinatown. He was throwing some kicks that were just just so bad. I can't believe they didn't speed up the film, edit it out, reshoot it with a double. Somebody, because they were just really bad. I mean, Bruce Lee would have turned over in his grave and said, wow, that's really bad. <laughs> really bad, right? But I'd, I'd watch that movie every time because it's about Bruce Lee's, you know, it's about Bruce Lee's life story. Right. How about books? Wow. You, you much, Dao much Jet Kune Do, number one. Number one. Okay. Why? And one because I mean Bruce Lee was like the Jimi Hendrix of martial arts. He's in there talking about fencing. He's in there talking about you know boxing. You know he's in there saying every art has something to offer. That's why it's the art of fighting without fighting. I have no style because I'm all of it. It's an expression of your soul. It's an expression of yourself. I mean he was the first one to really get martial arts to say stop fighting in a traditional you know right like a boxer like a righty. If you're a right hander, fight like a southpaw. Because you got your lead technique in front of you. That's brilliant. I mean, because of fencing, if I'm a right-handed fencer, I'm going to stand with my right foot forward. Because I want to lead, you know, with my right hand. If I'm fencing, I want to lead with my right foot. So Bruce Lee was one of the first people to do that. And I remember me and my dad would have arguments about this because I was left-handed. And he kept saying, no, no, you must fight like a right-hander. You must, you know, because back then left-handers were considered witches. And I thought, you know, I remember teachers punishing me for not writing right-handed because I was left-handed. I can't write with my right hand. So, <laughs> right. But I would fight like a righty because my dad made me, but in hindsight is foresight, it was developing um, upon Bruce Lee's already mindset. You got to fight both sides. Don't get me wrong. But Bruce Lee really always fought like a lefty because he wanted that lead technique forward. And we won't even get into the philosophy that's in that book, you know, that's there. And, and I think what it really embellishes, we do know Bruce Lee had a back injury. We do know he wrote that book at a time in his life where he was suffering, where schools weren't doing well. You know, but what he really did, you know, desperate measures for def- desperate times, he found, a, he found his voice through that book. He found his soul through that book. And every time I pick up that book, and I've got like four or five editions, every time they come out with the special hardcover groovy edition, I'll, I don't care. I've read the book. I'll get it again. <laughs> this one's got a new black holder and it's got a gold in, in, you know, embossed thing of Bruce Lee's thumbprint. I don't care. It's a great book. And I've given it, it to really- many people. You know, The Art of War. The Art of War is a brilliant book philosophically as far as, you know, life and how to understand your opponent. I think The Art of War is brilliant. Anything older books by Ed Parker, some of his early stuff when he was talking about angles and lines and stuff, you know, even though it was all theory, theory and it, a lot of it didn't have practical application, I even think Ed Parker was heading in the right direction with, with understanding what is combat, what is art. And, and I think really we need to understand that and anything that we read or do, you know, why are you doing the martial arts? Why? And when you pick up a book to read it, when you walk into a school to enroll, why are you doing it? Is it for fitness? Is it for self-defense? You know, is it for art? And I know that they're all good. And, and we have those two camps. Ah, if it's not practical self-defense, it's a suck martial arts. No, it's not. Try to do some of that hyper, you know, where you're spinning, you do a 720 through the air and there's a kick at the end of that. That's hard to do. That's really hard. You have to be a major athlete to do that. So I think everything has its place. So again, all these books that I read, I think it's time. It's time, you know, for me, wherever I'm at in my life, when I come upon one of these books and I pick them up and I read it, um, it, it, it resonates where I'm at in my life. But that book I always go to, the Tao Jit Kune Do, number one. Cool. Clearly, it's had quite the impact on yes, you. It has, absolutely. has a lot of meaning. We've talked a little bit about some of the stuff that, that you've got going on, and and you clearly have some some strong opinions on – the business of martial arts and, and the philosophy of running a martial arts school. So I want to give you the opportunity to tell us about that. You know, what do you have going on? You know, I know you've got your, your one martial arts programs and, and the patches, which I think are brilliant. So why don't you tell people about that stuff? Well, you know, my heart and soul is still in my schools, but I think what we've done, um, I wasn't going to open a second school because I travel, I speak, I teach, I write, and I have a couple online businesses. So it wasn't really a monetary issue. Uh, the first school grosses a million dollars a year, 600. I make 30% net. Um, what really came out of it was to prove to myself that a service-based martial arts school based upon serving people really well and learning ways to serve them better was replicable. See, people in the industry wrote me off as an anomaly. Ah, it's one school. You know, it's personality driven. So I stopped mm-hmm. teaching to prove that it wasn't about me and the school still flourished. 
based upon the systems that I wrote. Then he said, ah, well, it's an anomaly. It's still only one school. So we've had the second school now. We've been open six months. We just broke 162 students. Wow. That's a lot, right? In six months. That's absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Yeah, it's averaging thirty, thirty-three thousand dollars $33,000 a month at this new location since the day it opened. And it's growing. So it's proven now that it's replicable. And I'm only there a couple of days a week. So it's proven that my systems are replicable. But everything we do is, and I think what, what it's really showing the industry is the true Budo spirit. The spirit that I think martial artists are servants. We were meant to be servants to our community. You know, instead, I'm the master, you're, you're the lowly student, wash my floor for free, you know, and pay me for lessons while you're at it. Mm, yeah. um, so I think that's what I'm really sharing with the industry and all my programs is, is to understand that we are servants. And if we serve people really, really well and learn ways to serve them better, we can not only make a good living, you know, we can really make an amazing living, an amazing living, an amazing living. And I'm living proof of that. So I lead that movement. So yeah, I have the one merit badges because I really believe life skills are important. So whether it's mine or somebody else's life skills program, you need to see some type of life skills curriculum. Why? I'm not going to walk up to a soccer coach and say, please teach my kid focus and discipline. But I will walk into any martial arts school and expect it. So if you don't have some kind of great life skills system in place, you've missed the boat and your school will suffer. I remember you know, my dad said, well, you know, if you do 5,000 kicks, you learn discipline from doing it. I said, no, dad, I got a really good kick. You know, so I think much like a curriculum, you need a structured curriculum out there. And again, I'm going to go back to just don't think because you're a black belt, you're qualified to write a life skills system. You need to study child psychology. You need to read these books. You need to take courses. You can't just make up this stuff because you're a black belt and think it's valid. So life skills, I think, is that's why I created that. And then now where I'm at today, you know, I've, I've really been in the industry helping everybody, everybody, everybody. You ask anybody out there in the community and I help you for free, for free, for free. The challenge with that is it's now taking up so much of my time that either I monetize it or I stop doing it. Mm. That's what, what, all it's come down to. So after the last super show, so many people um, have been coming to me going, you know, how, what do you charge? How, how, can, how can I hire you to consult me? I said, I'm not a consultant. I'm a teacher. And I've worked on other people's courses too. So I'm launching a thing called It's Time. And I believe it's time to make the type of changes in the industry that need to happen. Either we're going to keep sitting here and, and, and repackaging, regurgitating the same old information and keep telling people, you know, you need contracts in order to be a viable business. I know some poor guy pays a consultant all this money, told him to take on contracts. This guy's losing $2,000 a month. Plus, not, well, I don't, we won't even say what he pays a consultant. So, see, because it was against his values. It wasn't in his true spirit. So, I, I am. But I stand in the line of fire every day. And it's been a rough one for me to make this choice to monetize what I do because I really want people's faith to be alive. And people love the fact that they can call me, find me at Facebook. And I help everybody, everybody, everybody. But I know I was talking to somebody in Germany and it was like two in the morning because of the time difference. And my wife gets out of bed. Literally. And she goes, what are you doing? I says, well, I'm trying to help this guy in Germany. You know, he's having challenges with his school or was in England. And, she, and after I got done, she goes, you know, it, 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 it's time. I said, no, I'm sorry, babe. I didn't mean to be on the phone this late. She goes, no, it's time. You're up all hours of the night, the day. You, you help everybody. It's time you start charging people for this. What you have to offer people is, is heads and tails above everything out there. And I go, yeah, yeah, but then, then I'm, I'm no longer Robin Hood of the industry. I'm not helping people anymore. She goes, yes, you will. And you'll be able to help them better because you can devote the time to it because you're making the money to support it. I get it. I get it now. I do, but I still won't stop helping people that need help. I, I, I won't do that either in that process. So, but it's time is a very select group, unfortunately, you know, because I can, there's only one of me and I want to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with each school owner. So that's going to require only working with so many, which you know, is, is a hard one for me because I want to help everybody, everybody. Right. So how about this? You, not everybody that's going to listen to this show owns a martial arts school. In theory, you know, the vast majority of them train in the martial arts, but I'm willing to guess that just about everybody has a job. So if you could kind of adapt some of that, that you teach martial arts school owners and throw out a nugget or two of advice for everybody with respect to their profession or job or or whatever what might that be well a couple of things number one write this down it's not about me it's about we you know jerry Maguire, that movie where i was so poignant when he looked at cuba Gooding and said stop being a paycheck player 
Stop, you know, saying it's, I'm not getting the ball. He's not thrown to me. The linemen suck. Same thing here. Stop it. Stop being selfish. You know, wake up every day and be grateful. Be grateful you, you, you have a job. And if it's a job you don't like, change it. You know, do something that you're passionate about, that has purpose, that you love, love, love to do. Well, not all of us are in your financial position. Some of us have to get up and go to work and do this job. I got a mortgage payment. I got kids. I hear that song and dance every day. Well, you know what? So do I. I have a mortgage. I have kids, but I've chosen. I've chosen and you have that choice. So if you call it a job, first of all, you, you need to quit. You need to go do something else. Because if it's a job, then you're in big trouble. Every day you should wake up and love what you do. Love, love what you do. And, and I've seen janitors that love what they do. And, and they're, they're the richest people I know because you know you can have all this money and all this fame and fortune. If you're unhappy, none of it means anything. You could have the best wife, the best everything, and none of it matters if you are unhappy. So take two steps further with that. Don't try to be happy. Find peace. What do you mean? It's American way. Happy. Got to be happy. Are you happy? Hey, is he happy? No, it's really about peace. And I don't want to be happy. I want to be at peace because I can't be happy with what's going on in the Middle East, but I can be at peace knowing that I'm very grateful each day I wake up, I get to be here. Mm -hmm. I can be at peace with that, you know, and that's it. I, I, I can be at peace that, you know, I'm 53 and when I throw a punch, it doesn't come out as fast as it used to when I was 23. I can be at peace with that and accept life on life's terms. So you, people that have regular jobs out there, take that martial arts spirit into the workplace. Be a team player. Lead by example. You know, if you want to advance in any kind of company, don't talk about, you know, show me the money. When do I get a raise? If you're supposed to be at work at 9 a.m., show up at 730. If, if you don't have to work on weekends, ask to work on weekends. You'll advance quicker and further in any job environment if that is your goal. Now, if your goal right. is to fly under the radar, be a paycheck player, do your nine to five, check out, go home and do that every day. You're going to wake up 40 years from now with a gold watch and a pension, luckily, and in, in today's economy. And you're going to go, what the hell happened to my life? I don't believe we're supposed to punch in nine to five. Living is not about a time clock. Living is about every moment, every breath, every second you're given. And if you can do that, you'll never have a job. Never. And you'll love what you do. That, that's wonderful advice. And I found myself nodding along to a lot of what you're saying. You know, certainly the things that you're saying here aren't things that you, you, you didn't invent these concepts, no. but you certainly put the, put them together in a very strongly constructed, very um, approachable way. And you can hear the passion that's coming through as you're, you're saying them. You're not just reading them off of a card no, or reciting something you read in a book. And, and I mean, Smith you, said in some little Instagram video, he goes, I think that's silly. People give ideas every day. Why shouldn't you use the ideas they give you? You're not copying or biting or ripping off people. That's why ideas are put out there. It's, it's, it's ego that says, hey, I'm going to sue you. You're using my idea. No, we write these ideas. We write these philosophies to perpetuate you know, a type of living to give people tools to, to be at peace. So yeah, you know, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm learning to drive the car better. I get that and I'm cool with that, but you're right. Some of it's Tony Robbins, some of it's Bruce Lee, some of it's Deepak Chopra, but when the day's done, it's like rock and roll, Jeremy. It's the same three chords, right? It's just the person playing it, interpreting it. You put a paintbrush in my hand, it's, I'm gonna paint differently than you, but it's still a paintbrush when the day's done. So yeah, we need to check our ego on both sides of that. People bite my stuff all the time. I happily tell people, use it. I'll use it to no one because, you know, it's probably Plato or it's probably Socrates or it's probably Confucius when the day's done, you know, we can keep going back, back, back until the beginning of time and give somebody credit for it that invented it. But I think that's ego. So, yeah, it's just, it's just my take on the whole thing. Right on. Good stuff. So if someone wants to get a hold of you or, or find out more about what it is that you offer you know, the, the one merit badges or, or any of it, how do they get a hold of you and find out more? Uh, you know, the biggest line to do that is Facebook. We know that. Find Brandon Beliso at Facebook. I'm there all over Facebook. Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest. And I've got things there, brandonbeliso.com. Google my school, One Martial Arts, whoever in San Francisco or Millbrae. School owners come from all over the world to see our culture because it is unique. You know, people trip. We have no front desk. We have no program director. We have no operations manager. All these things you're supposed to have in a business, we have none of those things. And they walk in and go, where's the office? We don't have one. Well, where do you close people? Where do you do your selling conferences? We don't. 
If we do our job from front to back, you walk up to the front desk and it's just a transaction. Well, where's the program director? We don't. It's simple software. A 16-year-old girl can process a service agreement, right? So people come from all over the world. So look up one martial arts. If you're in San Francisco, Millbrae, we always welcome people. And I'll buy you dinner when you're in town. Um, the OneMeritBadges.com, you know, it is what it is. We have over 300 clients worldwide, and we do almost zero advertising for it. Why? Tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about that. One Merit Badges is just life skills. You know, but it's taught in a simple, simple way. I ask people, when you're a fighter, how many techniques do you have in a ring? Some ego guy told me one time, I have a whole arsenal. Yeah, right. When you step into the ring, how many techniques, Jeremy? What do you think? Three, four? Half a dozen, maybe. maybe yeah. Right? On a good day. On a good day. But you got your bread and butter is probably two or three. Okay? Yep. Same thing here. I, I don't think you, you need a book to teach somebody about focus. If I can't say it in one page, then it's useless. So that's, that was one of the premises. Um, what's unique about it, there's no monthly subscription. You know, everybody gives me crap about that. All my friends that have, hey, you want to get that monthly subscription, $99 a month. That's the price point. Every month you get $99 from 300 people. I don't want to do that. I think it's bogus. You know, how, how many of these organizations you get materials you don't use, you never open the box that sits in the corner? All the time, right? Yeah. yeah, all the time. So that's what's unique about it. There's no subscription. And it is. It's one page, talks about the life skills. You got one match chat, student parent handout, and then people earn badges organically. People say, what do you mean? Because they're always asking me, what's the 10 things they must do to earn focus? I said, nothing. Well, what? What? Like that, that, that show. Remember Seinfeld? You know, yeah. They did that one episode. What's the show about? Nothing. And they're pitching it to NBC. Well, what, what do you mean? It's a show about nothing. It's just everyday life. It's the same thing here. If I see a kid looking at me when I'm talking, I might turn around and say, you know what, sir? You get the first focus badge of today's class. You're sitting still and looking right at me when I'm talking. That's awesome focus, which means pay attention. You know, because I think, we're, again, we live in that culture where we want to appear smart. So you look at the class, they bend their knees. You look away, they straighten out their legs, start talking to their friend. You look at them, they bend their knees. You look away. So what are they doing? Do they really possess discipline? No. They're simply looking for your approval. They simply want you to look at them and say, you're great, you're smart, you're amazing. Right? So the premise of, of one merit badge is, is to look for habit. And habit is what it's about. If I observe a behavior, then we award a badge. But that's sometimes really too kumbaya for some of these really military karate schools in, in, in the Bible Belt. They don't get it. They, oh, that's too kumbaya for me, man. Give me three things and, and then make my life easy. No, we're not sheep. Don't be sheep. Open up that box, venture a little further, embrace it, and make it your own. And that's what people don't get about one merit badges either. They want me to feed them everything, and I won't do that. I won't do that. I perpetuate people to be, you know, individuals, people to be leaders, not not to be sheep. Well said. And yeah, I would I would like to encourage listeners to at least check out what you've got going on yeah. online. You've got some wonderful websites, and and even if you're not a martial arts school owner. Yeah. There are some wonderful concepts. I mean, you, you heard the adv advice that Professor Beliso shared with us today, and there's a lot more out there that you can take from what he's teaching people, and I would encourage everyone to do so. So any, any parting advice as we start to sign off? Yeah, you know, there's that saying, my cup is neither half full nor half empty. You know, and then you say, well, you know, make a choice, because technically it's both. Is your cup half full or is it half empty? I'd like to take that a step further, you know, and I've read this before. It's nothing that I created, but I just want to expand upon it. Um, imagine you have a picture. So your cup is neither half full nor half empty. You have a picture of unlimited resources, unlimited potential. You know, we live in, a, a, think of the law of abundance. You know, we have the abundance. Take that and refill that cup. You're not in the middle of Ethiopia where you wake up every morning and you have to walk three miles to get, you know, some disease ridden water that's stagnant with mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a culture that perpetuates abundance. I think, you know, obese abundance in some cases. But don't squander that opportunity, folks. And I think we squander it because we live in an age of technology of self-centeredness where we have to have a selfie stick and we walk around taking pictures of ourselves all day and we sit at Facebook posting images of ourselves doing any little bitty thing and 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 then we sit there and 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 we put it up on a pedestal of it's something like it's so grandiose no it's not sitting in jail for 25 some odd years and coming out becoming president of Africa that's something to talk about you know stop celebrating mediocrity stop it 
and, and put down that selfie stick. Stop taking pictures of yourself. Stop trying to be the next YouTube, you know, sensation and, and, and where you got 3 million followers, but none of them know you. They're not your friends. Come on. They're not your friends. Get out there. Cree. Go clean the park. Go help somebody across the street. Do something real. Make an impact in the community. And that's where technology is dangerous. I use technology to perpetuate my purpose. But you won't see me sitting there posting a video about, look at me, I'm eating a hamburger. I ain't I cool? <laughs> that's not the purpose of social media for me. Nor is it to air my dirty laundry or to go after somebody else. But that's, again, my value system. But I'm going to say that, you know, I was, I don't know where I was. And I was just appalled. Everywhere I looked, people had selfie sticks walking around just all day long. And I'm going, wow, you're freaking 16. What have you done in this world? What have you really done? What? Hit the toilet seat every morning when you get up to pee? What have you really done? Right? So to perpetuate that, our culture has got to stop that. You know, we, we've got to stop that. So, and, and I, I don't say that in a mean, vicious way. I say that in a very heartfelt way. We need to put that stuff down and look each other in the eye on a human level and be grateful for every breath, every moment, every person that we're given the opportunity to interact with and be around. And, and that to me is something I think would change the world. Very poignant. And I thank you for sharing that and for everything that you shared with us today. Absolutely. This has been fantastic and not that anyone's going to get to hear it but this was definitely better than our first attempt yeah yeah well <laughs> you know and, and but but i believe that jeremy everything happens for a reason yeah and through the worst experiences i've been in the worst situations i've been in when i get to the other side of that and i look back i'm going oh man i'm so grateful i didn't stay with that girl i'm so grateful i didn't stay in that situation you know everything does happen for a reason i know the scientists don't believe that you know, that nothing is coincidence, nothing is by destiny, that's all hoopla. That's cool, you know, if you want to believe that, but I really do. I think the first one was probably really bad, or it didn't work out recording-wise, so we can get what we got today. You know? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I really thank you for being so open and being so honest and sharing with us today. No, I'm, I'm you know, It's been a pleasure having you here. I'm very grateful to have done this today. Thanks for listening to episode 21 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. A big thank you to Professor Beliso for coming on the show and sharing everything he did with us. If you liked the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would really make a difference. It's those reviews that help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com, and you'll get a free prize pack, including a shirt, water bottle, stickers, and some more stuff. And we're even going to pay the shipping on that. You can check out the show notes with photos and links to everything we talked about today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can keep up on everything Whistlekick. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. While you're at it, check out the great stuff we have at whistlekick.com. Gear, shirts, pants, and more. All made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.